Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's really great to be back here again after, uh, I guess, a year. It's hard to believe it's been a year since I came and gave the update last year. I really appreciate the opportunity, and it's great to be back. I uh, spent 14 weeks in Tallahassee since January 1st. Uh, we had five committee weeks, and then we had the nine weeks of session. And we're going back uh, June 1st for three weeks, so that'll be 17 weeks in the first half of the year. That's, that's a lot of weeks in Tallahassee. So I really like being back home again, getting back, back with my friends and uh, neighbors, and uh, also be able to go back to the work in my law practice. Um, what I wanted to do this evening is uh, sort of walk you through some things that happened in session. But before I get to that, um, I want to finish some housekeeping from last year. I believe I reported to you in 2014 that we had passed a bill dealing with military veterans' license plates. And we're coming up on Memorial Day weekend, and it just occurred to me that uh, the license plate design is now out. I'm going to grab this poster over here and show you this. Or if you, sure, if you could bring it up. And, um, what the bill did that I sponsored in 2014. Can everybody here? Uh, try to get this closer here. Um, we, uh, of course, the impetus of this was for uh, Korean War veterans and Vietnam War veterans, in particular, the bill that I was running. We had some Korean War veterans who came to me and said that they were very offended that Florida statutes had Korean conflict in it, not Korean War, and also the license plate said Korean conflict veteran. And so they asked me to change that law, and I looked at it and I agreed to do that. And as I was writing the bill, I noticed that they called the Vietnam War the Vietnam Era. And so we fixed that as well. So the bill was passed by the chambers and the governor signed it. But the license plate portion of the bill what we did is we asked, we required in there that the uh, Korean War license plate be called just that, Korean War Veteran. And then we put the Korean medal on there, for the Korean Service Medal on the plate. And then for Vietnam, we put Vietnam War Veteran. That was already authorized, but the medal was not. So we put the medal on there as well. You've seen that Vietnam Service Ribbon a lot, I'm sure. Because Vietnam veterans are now coming out and showing their pride after many years of feeling very hurt. But what I want to mention to you now is that these license plates are available to the veterans without additional charge. They do have to pay for the regular license plate fee like everybody else, but they don't have to pay extra to have these plates. So there's an application to be filled out. You have to provide proof that you earn the medal through your DD-214 or other proof. And then if you do that, you can get the, the uh, plate that I'm showing you here. And it also applies to uh, other war campaigns like the Iraq War, and there was a combat medical badge, a combat infantry badge, and so there's a lot of other custom plates, but the bill that I passed addressed these two plates in 2014, and they're now available, so I'm going to share the design. If you know any veterans who earn these plates, uh, I have applications on the seat there. There's a one-page application that you have to fill out, so you can pick one up and give it to your relative or friend or neighbor who might be either a Korean War veteran or a Vietnam War veteran, and let them know they have this opportunity the lawyers are not charging them for it, they've earned it. So I'm going to share that with you as housekeeping for one year. Thank you, Jerry. <laughs> and as we approach Memorial Day, we often think of all the veterans and those who sacrifice their lives in the line of duty, and that's the purpose of Memorial Day. But it's also appropriate this time of year, 42 years after the end of U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War, to remember in particular the Vietnam War veterans. How many of you are Vietnam War veterans here in the room? Anybody? Okay, and thank you for your service. But these veterans were disrespected when they came back from the war, and we owe them a debt of gratitude that's deferred and needs to be heaped on them now because they're aging and not to say that you do. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, we just to do the right thing. So we had a luncheon, there was a luncheon that occurred in Pittsburgh uh, yesterday. It was reported in the Daily Commercial. I guess it was actually, uh, yeah, it was yesterday, I believe. And uh, we had a parade in two years ago here. So just reach out to your Vietnam veteran colleagues that you know and tell them thank you and welcome home and let them know about the license plate. And just take some extra time to let them know their service was as valuable and as honorable as any group of veterans that served before them or since. They didn't, they didn't get that recognition. They got negative recognition from war protesters when they were spat on in airports and called bad names. And I saw it myself happen. And it was wrong and it should have never happened. People that were opposed to the war policy should never have taken it out on the veterans. So I just want to put that out there for you to consider. And I passed, we passed a resolution in the House, which we'll show you the number of, 
that respects and honors Vietnam veterans in Florida this year for that very reason. So with those two minor uh, housekeeping things I wanted to mention, we'll go right to the presentation now, and I'll try to go through this very, very quickly, <clears throat> understanding that it would be better to have some time for questions at the end than to, run, than to take too much time on this. So let's keep going. Um, I want to give you a very brief update on the budget and special session. We did not pass a balanced budget, as you know. We didn't pass any budget this year because of the dispute about Medicaid expansion. So we're going back on June 1st for a 20-day special session. I want to assure you we will pass a balanced budget during that time. All this talk of a government shutdown, I believe, is hyperbolic. The chamber leaders are not going to let that happen. What happened, the reason why it didn't go forward, each chamber did pass their own budget in week five, just like we normally have to. But those budgets are never identical, they're different. And this year they were far different because the Senate was planning on taking the federal money for Medicaid expansion and the House was not. So when you get the budgets per, uh, passed by each chamber, there has to be a conference now uh, between the chambers to reconcile the differences. And the beginning of that conference is the two leaders of the chambers agreeing on the number of dollars that are available. If you're gonna have a balanced budget past both chambers, you have to know how many dollars you're spending unlike Washington, where it doesn't matter. <laughs> but here, it matters. But if they're $4 billion different uh, apart, and there's not a reconciliation of that conflict, you can't go to conference. And that's what happened. We finished the week week five with a test of the budgets out of each chamber that were not identical, and we never went to conference because the Senate would not relent on Medicaid expansion. Now, whether you're for or against Medicaid expansion, as I analyze this, it's not as important as understanding the difference between a constitutional obligation and a statutory policy preference. And that's where the Senate leadership, I believe, got things wrong. In other words, I'm not gonna vilify them for wanting the Medicaid expansion that they thought was right. That's the policy choice they as senators have the right to advocate and their constituents can hold them accountable for that or not. But they shouldn't say to the House, an equal chamber, we want this statutory change in policy for Medicaid expansion so bad that we're going to refuse to meet with you on the $76 billion worth of state government that we agree on until you, the House, agree to take the federal money and expand Medicaid. That is confusing duties. The duty of a const the constitutional obligation to pass a balanced budget is mandatory, and we shouldn't walk away from that just because we don't get our policy choices on bills. Many bills are offered every year that don't pass because one chamber passed it and the other one wouldn't, or vice versa. So it's not right to say, well, because we have a policy preference, Medicaid expansion, which is a statutory change, that then has to be funded if you pass it. You can't put that ahead of the constitutional obligation of the balanced budget, and that's what the Senate did. And the House just said, we're not gonna accept that, it's not appropriate. So that's why we didn't get it done. But how we resolve that going forward, it's not entirely clear. But I think we got a little bit of help today from the federal government finally coming clean on the LIP program, which is a low income pool for indigent care for hospitals. And they decided to provide additional funding to Florida after all, which was a stumbling block to the Medicaid resolution before because we didn't know if we were gonna have LIP funding or not have it. That just came out today. I haven't even had a chance to see just exactly what the details are, but that's a, that's a good sign. So that's really my update on the special session. And now we'll go to the 2014 session. First of all, um, next slide, Amy. If you heard that nothing got done in Tallahassee this year, that was not true. As this chart shows you, we had a lot of bills filed, a lot of bills passed one chamber, and 188 bills passed both chambers, which means they went on to the governor. That's a lot of bills. It's not as many as we have passed before, but that's a lot of bills. So let me go up to the next slide. And start with some of the bigger ones. This is a, a leadership priority. I just put it up here because it had to do with um, helping people with disabling conditions, try to mainstream them more, creating a way of funding their special needs, expenses, and providing a, a trust fund for that purpose. Next. Uh, water resources was another leadership priority, and I co-sponsored this bill. It codifies the Central Florida Water Initiative, which is something that already exists but it's done by sort of agreement now. We're gonna make it statutory with this bill. This bill, by the way, did not make it in the law. The last one I just went over did, but this one ended up getting uh, caught up in the conflict with the Senate. So we'll be coming back to this, but this was going to help with our water resources greatly. 
education accountability. This is a testing bill that you heard about where we cut back on the number of tests that are being administered both statewide and locally. And some of the tests were actually eliminated. A cap on overall testing time was put in this bill, which is a very good thing that we have that. And uh, it's 5% of total instructional time. That's the maximum amount of time during the school year that can be spent on testing, which is 45 hours out of the whole year. And we also suspended the issuance of grades and teacher evaluations for this year's testing until those tests can be uh, uh, validated appropriately. Did this bill pass? It did, and the governor signed it right away. Adoption and foster care, this was a bill that was one of the leadership priorities, and it did pass. I, I uh, don't have a lot of information for you on this. It was mainly trying to make it easier for adoptions to occur, and one of the things that it was a program for state employees to have benefits if they go in and adopt a child and provide a forever home. Florida Public Service Commission, this is a bill that I co-sponsored, and this provides needed reforms to the PSC. Uh, one of the things I like about it the most is that it imposes term limits on public service commissioners. Also, mandatory ethics training for those commissioners, the same as the legislature has now. And uh, <coughs> lobbyist registration, those are really big things for the public service commission. To have the lobbyist registration especially, I think, is very important, and term limits. Human trafficking, this is one of two bills that passed. I co-sponsored both of them. Um, very, very briefly, a lot of this human trafficking that we hear about has to do with criminals exploiting people that have problems in their lives, whether they're runaway teens or women that are down on their luck and have had problems, and they draw them in and they get them addicted to drugs and they get them into prostitution and they basically make money off of them. They exploit them and manipulate them and traffic in them. And so to, to, uh, the way to fight this is to try to go after the people that are doing the trafficking. But we have victims too, and we also have people that are sort of creating the demand for the trafficking. So one of this, this, what this bill does, it increases the penalties for the prostitution, commit, the, those that commit the offense of, of uh, soliciting prostitution or engaging in it. So uh, that's the demand side, if you will. There's people out there that will pay for prostitution and they need to be punished more so they don't do that and there will be less demand for it. That's the thought behind this bill. So it increases if uh, first offense is a first degree misdemeanor, second offense is a third degree felony, and subsequent offenses are second degree felonies. And there's a minimum mandatory jail sentence of 10 days for repeat offenders. So this will toughen the, the penalties on that. Um, there was the other human trafficking bill, which is not up there, uh, that has to do with signage for victims. And these uh, strategic locations are going to put signs up with a toll-free number where they can call for centralized help for human trafficking. So that addresses the victims uh, along with the perpetrators. Okay, um, every member has six bills they can sponsor, and these are the six that I sponsored this year. Uh, three of them passed and three of them didn't. Uh, the first one is the hazardous walking conditions bill that I ran last year and told you about. It has to do with trying to identify and correct the conditions that are deemed hazardous for kindergarten to sixth grade students that walk to school. And this improves the process for that. It provides greater clarity about what is hazardous in statute, so there's guidelines, and then it has a process laid out in detail that doesn't exist currently for the local governments to follow along with the school board. And the school district is the linchpin of this. They have to initiate the request to determine if the condition is hazardous and then have it designated as such. And once it is, then the local government authority that has jurisdiction has to either put it in their five-year work plan or state a valid reason why they're not going to do that. And if they say they're not going to fix it, they have to tell the state of Florida that they're not fixing it. That will give us state-level data that we don't have now about what is being ignored locally and we can either come back with stronger measures or funding if need be. Tracking devices, you wouldn't believe how easy it is for someone to track your whereabouts if they want to right now. You can buy a tracker and put it on somebody's car. You see this in TV shows and movies, it's real. And they can actually program the software so they can know where you are and get an alert. Say, they didn't, say somebody wants to track you and know if you're going to a certain location, they can program that in the phone and then they'll get a an alert on their phone that you've gone to that location. I mean, this technology is scary, but it's threatening our privacy. 
And that's why I read this bill to basically say, you look at the bill does, it says, it is against the law, it's a second degree misdemeanor, if you install a tracking device or a tracking application on the property of another person without that person's consent. And there are a few limited exceptions, like if you're a parent, you want to track your child, you can do that. Or if there's an elderly person that needs uh, tracking for medical reasons and the doctor certifies that, you can track them. Uh, but not generally speaking, just because it's fun to do that. Does that apply to law enforcement? Law enforcement can only do it if it's pursuant to a bona fide criminal investigation, so they would need to have some probable cause for that. And that is, that is an exception to the bill as well. It's a good question. So this passed its waiting. Uh, so it's not yet on the governor's desk. It's a waiting uh, sending to him. They don't send all the bills all at once. They sort of spoon feed them so he can read through them and make decisions without being rushed. So this one hasn't been sent yet. Surveillance by the By the way, Senator Dorothy Hinkle, who was part of the late kind of legislative delegation, was the Senate sponsor of tracking devices and also <coughs> a drone. The House version of tracking devices is the one that the Senate voted out, so we, that's my bill that passed. Her bill is the one that passed for surveillance by a drone. She and I both are very interested in this. We were working on it independently, and then we figured out we were working on it independently with joint forces, and we have our sponsor in the other house very easily that way. So uh, the drone surveillance bill has already been signed by the governor. And this basically, you know, there's a lot of reasons why you could use a drone and it's okay. I mean, we have some exceptions in the bill as well. But there's very easy to spy on people with drones now. You can fly the drone, you have a camera on it, you can have a software program. There's even programs I've been told about, I don't know this for a fact, but if you're operating the drone, you can sit in your house and fly the drone remotely you don't have to have line of sight on it. And you can put on a set of goggles and you can look through the goggles and see exactly what the drone is seeing, like you're there. So that you have your joystick and you're flying the drone and you can go in somebody's backyard and hover and see what they're doing. I mean, it's scary. So what we decided to do is, since there are a lot of legitimate uses for drones too, draw the line on reasonable expectations of privacy. That's the language that I came up with. So if you're flying a drone down the middle of the street, taking a look at the neighborhood from the public vantage point, no harm, no foul. You're not invading anybody's privacy. If they're on their front yard in front of the street, then they don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy. <coughs> but if you hover that drone in their backyard and shoot it into their window or something, then it's actionable. And they can sue you and get an injunction, they can get damages, they can get punitive damages, and they can get attorney's fees and people that are aggrieved by that. So we put the remedy there in civil courts, not the criminal courts. Government accountability was one of the big bills I ran. That one, the senator who was handling that on the Senate side, Senator Gates, the former president of the Senate, he got that to the floor on Tuesday, Monday or Tuesday of the last week. I think it was Monday afternoon after the Rules and Calendar Committee of the House met. So it was just a day late. We couldn't get it on the agenda in the House because it came over from the Senate on day 55 and our agenda had already been put out for day 56. And that was the last day for bills on second reading, so it didn't happen. <clears throat> this bill would have um, defined the statute fraud, waste, and abuse. We actually created definitions of what they are. We put a mandatory obligation on every agency of government, <coughs> state level down to local level, to put internal controls in place designed to prevent, detect, or to detect and prevent fraud, waste, and abuse. We also had uh, lobbyist registration for more of the governments than currently have them. We had uh, clawback provisions for uh, a prohibited compensation. A lot of things, it was a very big bill. Uh, and we trying to make government more accountable, transparent and accountable with this bill. Unfortunately, it didn't make it all the way through, so we're gonna have to bring it back. Some of these bills are a multi-year project, like hazardous welcome conditions was. We don't give up easily on these things when they're important. Special districts was a glitch bill that should have passed. It didn't make it through the House Schools and Calendar Committee. I don't even know what happened to it. It passed every committee with no opposition, and it just didn't make it to the floor in time. This is a follow-up to my bill last year, which reformed the entire chapter on special districts in Florida. We don't have enough time for me to tell you about special districts as far as my concern about them. But there's over 1,600 of them in Florida. This is a shadow government uh, that exists throughout the entire state. They're easy to create, and they're very hard to get rid of, and they're hard to hold accountable. 
The bill that I ran last year, 117 pages, reorganized Chapter 189 completely and reformed it as well. Every special district is required to have a website now with all the information on the budget, the, who the officers are, you know, lots of information that doesn't exist right now. We're going to have this required. And also the oversight function was detailed in that bill. And this bill was simply a glitch bill, cleaning up some of the cross-references that we need to fix this year from last year's big bill. And damages and personal injury actions in current law, when there's a tort case where there's medical damages being claimed, like a car accident or a slip and fall, and they're putting in evidence of medical damages, the amount billed is what the lawyer can put in front of the jury now. And we all know if you ever got a bill from the hospital, the amount billed is not the real number. I mean, they'll have you know, $10 aspirins or whatever. But the amount paid is the amount that I think ought to be what's discussed in the court case. If your intention is to compensate somebody for what they've lost, then pay them what they've paid. But don't pay them what they were billed because there's a windfall built in there. And that drives the cost of litigation up and the insurance up, and we pay more as a result. That bill was dead on arrival in the Senate, however, because they don't like that bill. So we never got heard of it there. Those are my six bills. Three out of six is not bad. I was hoping for at least four. I was doubtful about government accountability because of the, so many people were opposed to that. Whenever you do something really good, people are opposed to it. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's true. Uh, people that, that run bills and there's never any opposition to it, and nothing just that all sails through, you know, you do a mother state resolution or here or there. I mean, you have to ask yourself why you're there if you're not shaking things up, you know. So I like to have a couple of easy bills because I can't handle six mammoth bills all at once. But I like to take on tough bills too. Okay, let's go to the next thing. Um, I already gave you the briefing on hazardous walking conditions. Actually, I had slides for each of those bills and I forgot that, so I'm sorry. We won't go through this because I already gave it to you. And next, that I gave you as well. Oh, you can leave it for just a second if they want to just scan it, but I think I covered all of that already. And that's what happens when I get ahead of myself because I'm trying to save time for questions. Threatening devices, okay, good. Um, drone, I covered that. Um, these are some of the exceptions that I didn't mention to you. Um, but the property appraiser's office that might be able to save some taxpayer, taxpayer money by using a drone to check out property for appraisal purposes. And I don't have a problem giving them an exception because they're elected and they're accountable and they're not going to use it only for appraisal purposes. Um, if the utilities want to check their utility lines with a drone, I don't have a problem with that as long as they're doing only that. And then we have under current Right now there's a review for possible delivery of cargo by drones by Amazon and they're working with FAA to come up with guidelines. We didn't want to be in the way of the business innovation there. They're not going to be spying in your backyard. They're going to be delivering packages that you request. And if you don't request it, they're not going to be delivering it. So I wasn't worried about that either. And aerial mapping, of course, is like Google Earth and things like that. They may want to take their techniques to drones as well. All right, that's the drones. Um, this is the government accountability. Uh, I think I covered most of that already. We also have all of our selection committee reform and uh, whistleblowers protection act reform in there. Okay, and I covered that already. Special districts and damages. I mentioned the Vietnam veterans resolution. Uh, that's just something that I felt we should do again because it came on the 40th anniversary at the end of April of the embassy evacuation. And I just know these Vietnam veterans um, have a lot of uh, you know, pent up feelings about how things happened because they saw the country change over time from being hostile to the military back in the 70s to accepting the military in the early 90s when we had the first Gulf War. And I just think it's important that we not forget them. We had Armed Forces Day uh, last Saturday and uh, I passed a resolution to recognize that. It's not a very widely known day, but it is recognizing federal law. Co-sponsored bills, um, I won't go over all of these. Um, the rights of grandparents is worth commenting on because that bill was around for several years. I tried to help the sponsor when I was chairman of civil justice for two years. And we finally got this bill done. There's a case in Orlando where the, uh, the mother of two young children disappeared. And the only 
person of interest for the disappearance is the father of her two children. Yeah. And once that occurred, he cut off the grandparents from ever seeing the children again. And this poor mother came to Tallahassee and pleaded with us for help. So we drew a very narrow bill that the sponsor did in Ruben at Ruzan to say that if there's a deceased or missing or comatose parent, and you have a relationship that existed between the grandparents and the children of that deceased or missing or comatose parent before the event occurred, if it's in the best interest of the child to continue that relationship, a court can make a decision on that. We give very narrow jurisdiction to a court to allow the visitation in that circumstance, and I'm hoping this lady in Orlando can use that to her benefit and finally get to see her grandchildren because Think about losing your daughter to a criminal act and then in your heart believing that the perpetrator of that horrific act is now keeping your children, your grandchildren away from you and you can't do anything at all. The law won't, won't, allow, won't intervene and allow anything. It's just not right. All American Flag Act, state government is not going to buy flags unless they're made in the USA. Yeah. 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 Special license plates adds to what we did last year with my bill. It adds some additional plates as well, uh, different uh, military plates and a few other plates as well. And uh, the human traffic can be covered. Disabled parking, um, disabled veterans are not going to pay for a parking permit with under this bill. And carrying a concealed weapon or a firearm, that's the evacuation bill that if there's an evacuation ordered by the government because of a storm event or something like that, then you have to vacate your home. You don't have to leave your weapons behind. You can take them with you. There's only, there's no reason not to do that, especially in that type of situation. So that's made it to the governor's desk. Yeah, got signed today. He did sign today. He signed it? <laughs> Uh, the Florida Civil Rights Act just extends protection and statute to women who are pregnant as a prohibited uh, grounds for discrimination. You can't, I can't believe that we didn't have it in there already, but you know, it's not right for any woman to be discriminated against in the workplace because of being pregnant. And this would make it illegal, although the courts have already done it last year, but this makes it official. Informed patient consent, Representative Sullivan did a wonderful job on this bill, and she had a great session, by the way. She's fantastic. But uh, this bill was a very tough bill, and she did it with grace and a plume. And basically, it just says that if a woman's going to have an abortion, that after the consultation occurs with the doctor, there should be a 24-hour waiting period for reflection purposes. And uh, there was a lot of uh, opposition from the Democrats primarily on this. There were a few Republicans who were also opposed to it. but. The way Representative Sullivan handled it, uh, I thought was awesome because they were saying, well, you know, how can you not be concerned about the women? She said, well, I am concerned about the women because many of them go to the clinic and at that time they don't even know that they're pregnant and they're rushed into a decision and right into the procedure room right after that. Yeah. And it's because the people in the clinic are trying to make money from doing the procedures. So she wants to empower them to have that mandatory reflection period of only 24 hours so that they can't rush that decision for economic purposes. They're gonna to have to say, okay, you come back and get at least 24 hours from now. And meanwhile, that gives that person a chance to reflect on this major decision. And if they still decide to have that the law allows that and this bill would not stop it, it just gives them time to think and not be pressured by people. So when you see Representative Sullivan, tell you thank you. And I don't approve of the president's approach to Cuba, so I signed on with the diplomat on the memorial about diplomatic relations with Cuba that opposes what they're doing. We don't think that the Castros should be let off the hook. No. Nope. Okay. And then uh, the final one here, the boot, it's in the middle, it's the Beirut Memorial. They're gonna, that was that Marine Barracks, a horrific terrorist attack in 1983 that I still remember vividly because it was, October of 83 was one of the happiest months for me because that's when our first daughter was born. Mariko and I became parents in October of 83. And I also was sworn in as a member of the Florida Bar that month. So this was like a really happy time for us. And then this horrific news of the Marine Barracks in Beirut came right on top of it. And it was just depressing. 
to see 256, I think, or so Marines killed in their barracks like that by these horrible terrorists. So this Marine Memorial, we're going to have a dedicated area in the Capitol for that, to remember that by. It's just something we need to do. You don't want to forget it. This was horrible, what happened to them. And the rest of those bills we covered already. So that brings us to questions. <laughs> OK. Yes, sir. Am I to understand that we did not have a penalty for human trafficking before we got this last latest bill? No, 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 the question is, did we have penalties for human trafficking before the bills that I mentioned? And the answer is yes, we did. There's, a, there's been a federal law for a long time on the books. And in 2011, we did a major bill in the Judiciary Committee that I supported and co-sponsored at that time. That was my first session. And we brought state law into uniformity with the federal law for that purpose. And we've been building on that every year since then. This is simply addressing signage for victims in the high areas or high risk areas where they think this is going on, we're going to put signs up that gives a toll free number. So if someone wants to reach out, they know where to call and get the help. And then the other bill just addresses the demand side because a lot of this human trafficking is motivated by greed uh, through organized crime and things like prostitution and drugs. So we're trying to say to the customers of these enterprises, we're coming after you too. I don't think your penalties are strong enough. My well, it, it, compared to the current law, it's quite a, a move up because if, if you have a repeat offender the second time, they're gonna, it's going to be a felony. And right now, it's a misdemeanor for as long as they keep doing it. It just adds up that they're still going to be misdemeanors. They're never going to be a convicted felon on the current law. So this is important to be upgraded. Well, yes, sir. Did any bill come up about medical marijuana discussion? Uh, well, I think there were bills filed on that by individual members. I know there was a, uh, one bill in the Senate and one in the House. It didn't get heard in committee, as far as I know. The only vote that occurred on medical marijuana, if you want to call it that, um, a vote on the issue, it was a bill for the right to try. It has to do with trials, drugs that are in trial stage that are not approved for use. And we were trying to make it legal for people that are terminally ill within one year of their anticipated demise to try whatever is available to them, medically speaking. And someone ran an amendment to say marijuana was part of that. I did not support that. I don't support medical marijuana until I have clinical evidence that it actually works. And there has been no clinical trials proving the medicinal value of it. I'm, f I'm in favor of letting our universities study it and, and try it you know, in terms of you know, do trials to see if it works. But, it's all anecdotal evidence. People are just saying they think it works, and that because of that, we're going to bypass normal uh, regulations and procedures for new drugs. I don't think we should do that. Yes, ma'am. Well, our bill was trying to tighten up things in that department. I don't think we were addressing specifically the bidding process, but in terms of conflicts of interest, I think we touched on that in the bill, and we're going to come back with it again. I mean, we want to make it, well, I mean, the, the principles that I believe in very firmly, and the work that I've done in the House, if you look at all the bills I've done, I do some in the legal arena because I'm an attorney. I do some for veterans because I'm a veteran, and I know that community very well, and they deserve our support. And then the, other, the third area would be government accountability. And that's the, where you get the special districts bill last year and the glitch bill this year and the government accountability bill. And the principles that I follow are transparency, number one, so you can see what's going on. Uh, oversight, which I think is really lacking, especially in these special districts. And then accountability. So what happens after you find out what's going on and it's not right, what happens? And we had some pretty strict provisions in our government accountability bill when we filed it, we had to soften it a little bit because we were running into brick walls in some of the committees. So, for example, golden parachutes were 
you know, the use of public money for golden parachutes. And there's different sides to this debate. I won't take up a lot of time, but you hear the argument from universities that we have to attract the greatest uh, talent around the country by paying them competitively. And I, I certainly agree that that's appropriate to pay someone what the market says they're worth if you want them as your employee. But then they come in and they have these severance packages that are basically golden parachutes that are huge amounts of money. And so we were trying to say you can't use public funds for those types of severance packages. But then we get the pushback from the hospitals, the port authorities, uh, the colleges, and universities that that will dry up their talent pool. And so they're lobbying all the members. And I'm going to the Appropriations Committee meeting, which has got 20 some members on it. And they're amending my bill like crazy to water it down, and I'm trying to fight off the amendment. And uh, I didn't succeed because I had some strong, powerful legislators trying to amend my bill. And it's not always easy to fight that back, especially when they're all getting lobbied on all these special interests. And the special interests don't say to the members, we're special interests, so we want you to support our position. They just say, the sky will fall if you don't support our position. We won't be able to hire doctors for the hospitals and the people will get no care and they'll die. Mm -hmm. It's always the sky is falling argument. It's never what it really is, which is, you know, they're just kind of making the case because they want their comfort zone to be maintained. So that's why we have to fight back. It's fun to do that, but it's not easy. Uh, yes, Mark. Uh, well, why don't you let our guest, who is it, Howard? Oh, Howard. Okay. Harold, why don't you ask your question first? Yes, sir. Uh, I would like to know, uh, you know about that bill about accountability. Uh, from everything you see and read and hear and everything, why would any politician want to be held accountable for the terrible things that they do? <laughs> no, I'm serious. You know, taking payoffs like from the NRA. The NRA owns so many politicians and tops really beyond belief. I used to be a member of the NRA. What they do, and uh, you know the politics. To me, now this is my opinion. The politicians are just in this for what they can get, and the hell with the people. Uh, and, and it seems to just go on and on and get worse and worse all the time. If the politicians that are in Washington now were held accountable, we wouldn't have any. You're here. They'd all be in jail. Well, there's a lot of things wrapped up into your question, and I don't know where to begin. President, well, no, I mean, yeah. the point is well taken. I mean, anger against government. Here's what's the, the bigger threat to our country is, as I see it. It's kind of high altitude, but um, we're losing respect for the rule of law in yeah. this country. And it goes to, I think, an integrity crisis at its core. Uh, it's like if you don't agree with the law, you can flaunt it, you can ignore it. If you don't agree with the Constitution and you're the president, you can flaunt it, ignore it, you can use your pen and your phone to do things that you think are good. And maybe in his heart of hearts he believes the things he's doing are good. But there's a rule of law to be followed here. And you know, take the president's executive action on immigration, where he says Congress didn't act, so I'm going to. Well, when Congress didn't act, just like the House of Representatives in Florida didn't act on Medicaid expansion, that's a decision. That it's a decision that current law is what we're going to maintain. And that means you, the president, have to execute current law. You don't get to rewrite it because you don't agree with our decision. But unfortunately, the debate becomes, well, if Congress doesn't act, should the president act? We should never be discussing that as an option. If Congress doesn't act, that's where it ends because that's a lawmaking body. So for folks like yourself with that question, you're frustrated with government. I'm frustrated with government. I see a lot of good people in Tallahassee. I don't agree that they're all crooked or that they're all uh, that they're good people that want to do the right thing, especially at the state level, and we have proof of that. If you look at the, the ranking of Florida among the 50 states for taxing liability, I mean, we have the lowest per capita employee count of any state in the country right now. In other words, we have fewer employees uh, at the state level based on the population, if you did the math. We are the lowest of all states. We have low taxes in the state. We have a balanced budget now. Like we didn't pass one this year, we're going to, but when we do, it's balanced. And we have a $690 million tax cut package that we included in our budget in the House. So we were giving back money to the people who earned it rather than spending it all. 
So it's not as dire or grim as your question implies at the state level. I will grant you that at the federal level, I mean, and you talk to Congressman Webster and people like that, they'll tell you the place is dysfunctional. And, and he's doing his very best up there to try to turn that around. But it's systemic and endemic up there. It's not something that one person necessarily can even do by themselves. You have to get an entire wave election to change them out. This is why I think the biggest reform we could enact in Congress, I don't know how we get it done. I, I've worked on it in the House of Representatives in Florida with my memorial calling for a convention of the states under Article 5. That, I think, is the avenue. And I've been to every one of the uh, meetings. So the term limits for Congress yeah. is the most yeah. important thing because I can tell you the term limits in the Florida House and the Florida Senate work. Now, you people gripe about it that we're losing a lot of talent. Look at how people come in. They don't have enough time to become experts, and they have to leave. But I can tell you I've already been in three terms now. Or I'm in my third term, so I've seen three classes come through, my own and two behind me. And I would say, even though we lost good members to term limits, the ones we got in return far exceeded the ones that we lost. Because they're new, they're fresh. They have energy, they have ideas, and they step up to the plate, and they're all just doing great work. Jennifer Sullivan is an example locally, but there's many others like her in her class and the class before her that followed my class that have done wonderful work. Uh, that Public Service Commission bill was a sophomore's bill. Did a great job on that. So I think we're getting really good people for term limits, and I'd love to see it at the federal level, along with a balanced budget amendment, all along with a line out of veto, along with limits on the power and jurisdiction of the federal government, and I think if we had all that, we could have our republic back the way it was before we, we went off the rails with the New Deal. Yeah. 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 Okay, Mark, and then I'll come to you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, on the accountability line, you know, we have the Central Florida Expressway Authority, and it's composed of both people who are there by virtue of another elective office, you know, like one of our county commissioners, or they're appointed by uh, the governor's office. And given a body, that much impact on the population because of the transportation network that they run and the revenues that they take in as a result of the tolls and the amounts that they spend, wouldn't it be better if those offices were directly elected by the people as opposed to burdening the county commissioners? So I've, I've seen some of the, the, the other bodies that are, that are similarly staffed and you see the elected official come in you know that they're completely unprepared for the matters that are before them and it's all being run by paid staff and you're, you don't have any direct accountability as a result. You got a lot of good issues wrapped up in that question as well. <laughs> and, uh, philosophically, I like the idea that if there's taxing authority with an agency that they be elected. I don't like appointed members of a board that has taxing authority because there's no accountability for their taxing authority. So I sponsored a bill in my first session to make the St. John's, well, to make all the Water Management District Board of Trustees members elected for that reason. I couldn't find a Senate sponsor to file it. I even consulted with our then freshly uh, departed uh, Senator Baker about that. He said he fought that battle and he had a hard time too. So there's not a lot of stomach for it, but I think the idea behind it is solid. Now, the idea that we would have county commissioners on that current expressway authority board. Um, county commissioners are paid something like seventy some thousand dollars a year. I don't look at that as a part-time position. They ought to be able to embrace the duties that they are given for that type of salary. And I would expect them to do that, and I think they could do that. And I like the idea that they're familiar with their transportation needs in their own county. Like our commissioners sit on the Metropolitan Planning Organization for Lake and Sumter counties. So having a commissioner who's on the MPO, on the county commission, which is dealing with things like gas tax and, and transportation projects on county roads, and then having them sit on the express authority board, and they're elected, I'm okay with that, actually. If they're not doing a good job, that's a case about their performance in the office they hold for the voters to make a decision about. But I'm okay with that. I'm less okay with the idea of non-elected people having taxing authority over, over taxpayers. But, you know, the problem is if you have it all elected, you might lack the expertise you need on some of those. That's the risk you take. Because uh, right now the governor can pick people based on their experience and their skills. And I'm sure he does that with appointments like that. So, yes, DJ. 
you really time to get up. Uh, Larry, don't you think it's time we get the most interesting book that I've been pushing and reading about into our curriculum again, into our Florida schools, into part of the federal papers? Well, there's a statute on the question is, should we get the Federalist Papers in the curriculum in schools? And there's already a statute dealing with, there's a chapter actually, or an area of the statutes that has mandatory curriculum items in it. And uh, civics education and the founding documents is already in statute. If they're not doing it, then that's a school board issue. Yeah. Well, but it's, it's there. I can show you if I had the statute book with me, I could open it up and show you where that's been well, required. I'm sure that they don't know what to believe in. How do you want to love something that you don't know anything about? Well, I agree with you. The schools need to do more of that in that area, but I have a belief that parenting is lacking in many cases, and the values of society have to be passed down by generation to generation. It's not just government institutions that are charged with that. Government institutions can help, and I certainly respect and appreciate the education I got growing up in Philadelphia when they took us to the Liberty Bell and Independence Hall. Uh, as elementary students on school trips, we, did, we now we send our kids to theme parks. <laughs> so you know, I had an advantage being in the city where the country was founded, but you know, still we can send our kids to St. Augustine and teach them history, but we send them to Bush Gardens instead. So we need to have parenting back and in charge of that, and inculcating the values of the current generation into the next generation, and not leaving it to Facebook and TV and and other things. Um, okay, um, I don't know how much time we have. I'll go as long as you want to go. we got time. If you guys want to stay, what is up to you guys? I've got a long list. <laughs> okay, well, let's go to this gentleman here. I've got a question about the bill that allows people to register to vote via internet. Yes, sir. Uh, online voter registration. Uh, nine House members voted against that, and I was one of them. On the way to the government. It's been signed by the government. Okay, right well, my reason for voting against the bill, I mean, I think we will get there eventually, but knowing what I know about data breaches, I ran a data breach bill for the Attorney General in 2014 and we passed it in the law. That was our state response to the target data breach that occurred the year before, 2013, if you remember that. And we have North Korea uh, hacking into Sony, right? So uh, we know there's evidence of hacking going on and the breaches of security. So then we have our chief elections officer, Secretary of State Pencer, saying he's concerned about it, doesn't support it. So I just don't think I can take the information I have and vote for a bill like that. I mean, even though they're putting it off for a few years and they're hopefully going to work the bugs out, I'm just not convinced that we're ready for it yet. Eventually we'll get there. I agree with you. That's a concern that I have. And I think that concern I have actually is extends even now. Uh, yeah. I mean, because the motor voter bill that the federal government yeah. passed in, in the mid 90s under Bill Clinton, yep. basically they can check a box on a form and send it in. And if they check that they are a citizen, that's considered yeah. to be enough. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you have to believe that we had 20 million illegal aliens in the country during the big boom that we had that some of them registered to vote through that process. And I've ever seen a TV show, an expose, where they have a hidden camera and they're like yeah. talking to the, um, I think you, they're talking to someone and he said, he's like, he was opposing as a illegal, he said, I'm an illegal alien, can I vote? Yeah, you gotta go register there. Well, how do I do that? I'm illegal. Well, you just tell them you're a citizen. Did you see that video? Oh, yeah. And it was like yeah. one person after another after another, and they're able to register to vote. So. I mean, it's wrong. Paper ballots. Yes, sir. My question on the budget. Um, the difference between uh, the House and the Senate, the Senate wants to accept the money from the federal government for Medicare or Medicaid. Is that the difference? The Florida Senate is willing to accept the federal Medicaid money with their version of Medicaid expansion, which uses private insurance and has some provisions that they call conservative guardrails. Um, I didn't really touch on this, but I'll be willing to share with you the reason why I do not support Medicaid expansion. There's a lot of reasons why you could find opposition to it, but the biggest one for me is that we have to look at current Medicaid. In other words, we're asked, being asked to expand something that we already have. 
So before we start looking at the expansion and saying yes or no, let's look at what we have and see if that's something we're happy with. There's no sense uh, making something bad worse. So looking at the Medicaid program, the numbers on it, in the 1998, 1999 budget year, Medicaid was 18% of our state budget. In 2014, 2015, Medicaid was 31% of our state budget. Now the budget got bigger during that time from 98, 99 to 2013-14. So it's a bigger, bigger percentage of a bigger pie, and it's projected to go even higher to I think 36%. I think I have the number here, and I'll get that for you. 36% in 2022-2023, under current Medicaid right now. Now you look at projections in other states that have taken Obamacare expansion, and I saw a study that 17 states that went with the expansion, the enrollments under the expansion were 91% higher than projected originally. And the population that we're talking about expanding it for, well, I didn't finish my first point really before I was going on my second point, but my original position is it's a federal entitlement program. Yes, they pay 60%, yes, we pay 40%, but look at the rate of exponential growth since we've had it already. Mm -hmm and we're paying a bigger and bigger percentage of our state budget to sustain the program that we have now. And what that does, it limits our ability to spend more on education, on public safety, on the environment. Whatever your priority is at the state level, there's less money available for consideration when we have to mandatorily fund an entitlement program. And you have to take everybody that comes through the door, regardless of the cost. It's open-ended, that's my main a principled objection to taking on the expansion is that it's already an open-ended entitlement that's growing exponentially. Why would we, knowing that, why would we take more of that on? And the population that we're being asked to fund with it is mainly uh, able-bodied, childless adults that have no disability. Up until now, including current law, it's for children who are poor, elderly who are poor, and disabled adults. But now we're going to say to able-bodied, healthy adults that have no children, you're eligible too, and take that on and have that program grow exponentially over the time. I mean, it's just bad fiscal policy. Now, that's my main reason for it, so I won't support it. Just thank you. The funds from the federal government run out after a certain time. And if the president can say, okay, all these people that are here illegally are here illegally now. They're eligible for this. So there's millions of other people that aren't available to have this coverage now. It'll just blanket be added. Plus, doesn't the money run out from the federal government? Well, it's 100% uh, it's funding until 2016 and 90 percent thereafter, but that's if they keep their promise. Yeah. yeah. So that's another argument against it. I haven't listed that as my first argument, which is that you can't trust the federal government. They're not a reliable partner. Yeah. I put it high on the list. But even if you can trust them, even if you assume that they'll honor their part of it, why would you take on an entitlement program that's going to grow exponentially and crowd out your other priorities? Yeah. I'm limiting the future legislators that follow in my footsteps after the long term limited out. And so what they can do for the people that elect them, because we've made a decision that we can't ever take back. And it's just not right to do that. I think we need to be more fiscally responsible than that. And, you know, entitlements are easy. So certain, certain things are easy to say yes to when you're in public office. Yes is the easy, popular answer oftentimes. But no is the right answer more often than not. When you talk about expanding government, reducing freedom, or doing things like that. So uh, Congress said yes too many times. And look at the $18 trillion in cumulative public debt that we have there. There's, there's no end in sight. They can't take it back now. They can't walk it back. Yes, Chair. What will be the appetite in future sessions to repeal Common Core? Uh, well, the repeal, of the, I mean, the Florida standards, as they've been renamed after the bill in 2013, and with the testing reform, they've been reduced slowly, but they're still, of course, I think, there. And uh, I just don't see the appetite in Tallahassee for that. Just being candid with you. I mean, I, I know that the uh, the educational stakeholders have a loud voice in the process, and they're largely okay with what we have now. We did pare it back, and there's been a lot of things that have been done that make it less onerous. 
there's more flexibility at the district level to do the curriculum, and that's good. And we have accountability for our school board members, that's good. But I don't think there's gonna be major changes on that anytime soon. Yes, Mark, and then Norm. Yeah. Or, I'll go to Norm. Yeah, Norm. yeah I have, uh, it's kind of a big thing. On the federal level, we have the EPA and, and a lot of other agencies out there who are making laws and regulations and affecting us probably more than the legislature in Washington. And with all those districts and everything we're talking about here in the state of Florida, are you talking about the water districts and the hospital board and all, all these different, and how many did you say there were? There's over 1,600 of them in the state of Florida throughout the entire state. I'm wondering if they're not also making policy and doing things that is not in our interest and what can we do to shut them down, to merge them, and to consolidate them, and to the... All that's in Chapter 189, Norm. It's just a matter of... Uh, the problem is most of them were created by the legislature, and they're easy to create, and they're hard to either reform or eliminate. And you guys know what happened with the North Lake County Hospital District in 2012, and that was not an easy bill to run. Uh, but that will be an opportunity for the voters to make, make a decision on the continued existence of that district in 2016. But that's not very often done. Do you have a feel for that? Do you think we're going to be able to be successful there? I don't really know, Norm. I know that the uh, the district, or, you know, the district, the board of trustees, uh, if you go to their website, they have a lot of information now. I mean, they've come around to, compared to where we were before 2012, where there was no website, no information, now you can go on that website, you know who the board members are, you can send them an email. The budget's there, the uh, enabling legislation is there, the audit reports are there. Uh, I had some people look at it at the Joint Legislative Auditing Committee and they came back to me and said, this is one of the most transparent special districts we've seen. So that bill has worked in that sense and they're using the money for indigent care. So they have a case to make. But the fundamental issue is whether you wanna have a tax on your property to support hospitals. Uh, 12 counties in Florida Act 67 have said yes to that at some point, either through the legislature or through their own re referendum. Uh, but the other 55 counties don't have it. So it's a, it's a fact you have to weigh when you make a decision on that. Should we have it now? Do we need it now compared to when it first started back in uh, the 1950s and later in the 1970s with the so it was two separate districts that were merged at one time, and it's now one district for the entire North area. But I think the board has come around and providing information on their website. They're making decisions now as a board. It used to be a rubber stamp, passed through board, and now they're actually making decisions. They haven't reduced the millage rate yet, though. That's kind of a little bit of a surprise. I thought they would have done that by now. How odd that is. Yeah, but anyway, at least you have information now, and you can act on it. Um, let's go to somebody. Did I get everybody who hasn't had a shot yet? Okay. Or, Larry, how many electoral college votes in Florida have? You know? I think it's 29. Um, Same as representatives. 27 representatives and two senators. I think it's 29. Now, on Rush Limbaugh. There was 27, but we added two. On Rush Limbaugh's program, he mentioned that California and New York and Massachusetts they have accumulation. I think it's 20, is it, uh, the, number, the number of reps is 27, and you have to have two for the senators, so it's 29. It used to be 27. So yeah, I first, think the total is 435. It is four, no, it's, uh, yeah, 435, yes, right. In, in the House, yeah. Right. right. It's 535 total electoral college votes. I think that's what the, what the total. There's 435 House members in, in, the, in, in, in the House. House. There's 100 senators, so there's 535. There's actually 437 in the House, but two are not voting, I believe. So well, that would not yeah, be electoral votes. Uh, so you've got 535, and you need 270, I believe, for the electoral majority. They have a bank of votes. They do. Mm -hmm. 
But every 10 years, they lose it because more people are moving out of those states into the south. But know, they're coming to Florida. Yeah. That's the problem. The problem. Yeah. Florida, yeah. Texas, yeah. And other states. Well, I think we've run our course, haven't we? Yeah. Yes. Mark's got it. Well, I was going to say, all the teachers I've talked to have yeah, the, yeah, the rank and file. Uh, I understand the legislature may not have the appetite to take up the Common Core or Florida standards and revisit it. But what I'm hearing from long-term educators, like my ex-wife, is that the environment from their view, you know, who are dedicated educators, you know, good, bad, or indifferent, is that it's become a nightmare for them to try and do their jobs mm -hmm. the way they see fit as professionals because of these mandates. And as they get filtered down, it's almost like back when we were in the military, you had a 10 o'clock parade you were ordered to be in the first formation at 6.30 because at each level, a half hour was added on to it so that you would be at the parade on time. That's exactly what you're seeing here uh, at, at, at the ground level. It's what I'm hearing. They hate it. And they hate it. They hate it because it's just tied in their hands. They have no choice in the matter in terms of delivery. And they're certain they're having to test, teach to the test. Because they, they, it doesn't matter if they've been given total flexibility, if their students fail because the metrics that are on the test aren't taught, then they get graded poorly in their performance. So well, if we had come up with something better, I mean, I would be in favor of, I'm, I'm fine with getting rid of what we have and replacing it with something better, but there was never really anything coming behind it. In other words, repealing it alone is not going to be enough because you have to know what you're replacing it with. Right. You can't right. run back to the 2009 standards right. easily. There's no other textbooks are around. Right. Well, that would be the ultimate reform for education. It would be a free marketplace where money follows the student to a choice. There you go. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, this competition will drive quality up and cost down. Absolutely. Yes. Hey, Mary. Um, I'm injured, so I'm not going to stand up. Um, on, the, on the Common Core, one thing that everybody needs to understand is that, number one, it was never passed. So there's no repealing. There's nothing to repeal exactly, you can change it. Number two, this year's testing, apparently because of something that happened in Tallahassee, these kids are being made to take the test unless they opt out. So, so time and money both are being spent on the test, but if the results of the test would negatively impact the student, the test is disregarded. So what we have in our schools is a situation where teachers are having to test, but if the child flunks that test and that test result negatively impacts the child's grades, it's being ignored. It's, it's EOC, and I forget what EOC is. And of course. And, and, okay. and they're not, and they're, that's my understanding. Well, just to bring this to a conclusion, because I know people have to go, um, we did a lot of good with that testing bill this year to get rid of some of the tests and reduce that down. That will be a good thing to get started on now, and then we'll have time to revisit this issue. I'm sure we'll be revisiting it every year, and we may come up with something even better, and if we do, I'll be all for it. I'd like to see us get back to basics, actually. Uh, there's a lot of things you can do there, I think, that are just following the KISS principle. Keep it smart. That's going to let you